breaking. The breaking of every chain. The breaking of every stronghold. The breaking of every soul tie. We thank you for the breaking. We thank you for the breaking. No power of the enemy. No stronghold of the enemy. Whatever has the power to hold its grip. We thank you for the breaking. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your power. Your resurrecting power. Your resurrecting power. Your mighty strong power. Your delivering power. Your redemptive power. Your restoring power. Your healing power. Your healing power. Your delivering power. Your saving power. Your saving power. Your saving power. If it had not been for the mercy of Jesus. If it had not been for the grace of Jesus. If it had not been for the love of Jesus. If it had not been for the love of Jesus. If it had not been for the love of Jesus. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your power. We thank you for coming to see about us. We thank you for hearing every single prayer. We thank you for seeing on the inside. We thank you for healing from the inside out. We thank you for changing from the inside out. We thank you for your power. Somebody ought to bless the name of Jesus. We command the kingdom of God to be made manifest in the bodies of your creation. We trust you to manifest as Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. We release the kingdom of God into the emotions of the sons and daughters. We loose the lordship of Jesus Christ into the nervous system of every believer and every place that this sound of intercession is lifted. We calibrate that place for miracle signs and wonders. We take authority over the latitude and the longitude of every place that this sound of worship and prayer will be played. Father, bless well, greetings and God bless you. It's wonderful to be here with you tonight here at the river. Apostle Rod and Prophetess Selena Stevenson bid you greetings. The river's family, we bid you greetings. Hello, Facebook. Hello, YouTube. You are tuned in to our Wednesday evening midweek broadcast, and we just say thank you. We're just so honored that you could worship with us tonight. We want to give you time to sow a seed tonight and really purpose in your heart to honor God. And you know what? I recognize that sometimes that might take a little work to purpose in your heart. The scripture says in Second Corinthians nine and seven, that each one should give what he has decided or purposed in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver or another way to say that is God loves a ready giver. So see, sometimes we have to get our hearts in the right place and in the right posture. I know with all that is taking place and the challenges that we face sometimes, that's why I say sometimes that takes a little bit of work, but we purpose in our hearts to honor God and to give him the best of what we have because we recognize that he is good and that he is faithful and that he takes care of his children. Has God been good to you? I know that he has. And so I want you to purpose in your heart to give to the Lord out of a place of honor, 
to give to the Lord tonight out of a cheerful heart, because that is the heart that God loves. You can text your gift. The number to text is 231-221-2160. That number again is 231-221-2160. Text the word give and include a dollar amount. You may also give by using Cash App at dollar sign R-O-L-W Muskegon. Please visit our website where you may also give. And our web address is rolwmuskegon.com. And then lastly, you may mail your check or money order made payable to ROLW. And the mailing address is 1550 East Lakedon Avenue, Muskegon, Michigan, 49442. God bless you tonight. We, again, are just so glad that you decided to worship with us. Thank you for partnering with us tonight as we go before the Lord. We want to give way now as we receive our worship ministry. They're going to lead us in a time of worship as we prepare our hearts and as we ascend. Lift your hands and lift your heart to the Lord. Make yourself open, make your heart pliable to receive from the word immediately following our worship presentation. God bless you. We'll give him a hallelujah. We'll give him a hallelujah. Because Christ was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities and our wrongdoings. The punishment required for our well-being fell on him. And by his stripes we've been healed, we've been redeemed. We've been transformed and we've been set free, no longer bound to sin. For the perfect Son of God in all his innocence, he'll walk in Glory. 
trying not to weep <laughs> I'm trying to hold it together even though um resurrection Sunday has passed but um those words just so ministered to me um just the the lyrics your cross it was my freedom your stripes it was my for my healing all praise to King Jesus glory to God in heaven your love, come on, how many people know that God's love is still reaching and his blood is still speaking? Come on, the blood of Jesus, it is still speaking today. Hallelujah, all praise to King Jesus. Glory to God forever. Is there anybody on tonight other than me that says, I'll praise you forever? It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter what it feels like. It doesn't matter what I'm going through because you went through all that you went through. Hallelujah for me, for my sake. And sometimes we do have to make it personal. What God did specifically, you have to look at it and say, you did this just for me. I think it was a song that said, just for me. <laughs> he did it all just for me. Hallelujah. But I won't stay there on tonight because I have a word, I believe, from the Lord. Thank you for tuning in on tonight. I greet you in the name of our Lord. I greet you on behalf of our senior leaders, Apostle Rod and Prophetess Selena Stevenson, and the whole Rivers of Living Waters family ministry leadership and congregation. Congregation, we are so glad that you join with us on tonight. Hallelujah. Whew, thank you, Jesus. So glad that you could join with us on tonight. 
And so we've been in this place and in this season. I'm going to pray real quick. I'm trying to get my thoughts and mind together. God, been, it's such a whew, glory to God. Like, I want to go into a praise break. <laughs> Hallelujah. But there is a word. Thank you, Father. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise on tonight. We come to lift you and to magnify you and to glorify you in this place. Our whole heart's desire is for you to be glorified, for you to be lifted high. Father, I thank you for the opportunity, for the privilege. I consider it a privilege to minister the word of God unto your people. In and of myself, I'm not worthy. But because of your stripes, you deemed fit and you saw that we are worthy, that I am worthy to go forth with boldness, with courage, and to minister your word. And so I thank you for the word of the Lord that is in my mouth on tonight, for the love of the Father that is in my heart on tonight. And let that be on display, Father, none of me but all of you. These things I do pray now in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Thank you. We've been in this series on a revelation of God's love. And I don't know about you all, but this message has been Man, it's been messing with me. <laughs> Even the message tonight, it's been messing with me. It's been challenging me. Um, somebody said, I read the other day, it said, don't read the word, but let the word read you. And then somebody else said, you can't just read the word. You have to read the word. And so I want to encourage you, don't let this messages just be messages. But let this be the sure, strong word of the Lord that comes and locates you and finds you and penetrates your heart. It, this word has challenged me in so many ways. It has caused me to examine my own heart. Uh, I really had to take a look at why I hadn't received God's love, the reasons that caused me not to believe that God loves me. Come on. I know there's other Many other people other outside of me that for one reason or another, you didn't always believe that God loved you. Why I hadn't loved God, maybe in the best way that I knew how or could, or even his people the way that I should. And it has caused me to want to get some things right. And so I believe that a sign that you're listening, you're hearing, you're paying attention to the word of God, that it should challenge you to want to make right what's wrong. It should challenge you to um, examine the areas of your heart, like these messages that's been going across, how we love people, how we treat people, how we love God, how we see ourselves. Um, just a testimony, a prime example, a couple weeks ago, you know, I was in a place and I was talking to God about something and, and I was like, Lord, you know, what's in my heart? Show me what it is in my heart. And if there's something that I need to do, you know, show me what I need to do or who I need to forgive or what I need to let go of. And he made it so clearly. He brought a, per a specific person to me. And then I heard the word of the Lord said before you... um give your offering. He said, lay your offering at the altar and go and make it right. And so in that moment, I knew I had to go and make it right with that person. There were some things that I was feeling. And even with just going to that person and making it right, it really, even what I thought, it wasn't what I thought it was. And so I'm just sharing that to say that these messages, it, it should be producing some type of fruit. It should be causing you to places where we've been out of order, places where we have not been in the will of God or where we have not been aligned. I, I think Providence Selena will say, we, well, we need some adjustment set where we need some adjusting at we have to go and we have to surrender we have to submit we have to yield to the adjusting of the Lord amen I've come to realize that this isn't just one of those messages that you can hear and say oh that was a good word you know we come to church and so many times we say, oh, that was a good word. But then later on, somebody asks you, what was the word? You don't even remember what the word was, but it was a good word. But that's, a, that's, an, that's evidence that that word didn't really locate you or penetrate you. We can't just say that this is a good word with no real intent to apply it. This is my opinion, and I'm putting this out there because this really is just my opinion. 
I can't say this for a fact, but my opinion, I believe that one of the main reasons that God began to speak about a revelation of his love is because for the last decade or so, the church has become so consumed. Come on, the body of Christ, his bride, the ecclesia, the called out ones. We've become so consumed with his hand his hand, the promises of God, the benefits of God, the power of God, but we haven't been always consumed with his heart. We've turned our churches into businesses and brands. We've modeled our churches after the world. We've become like the marketplace inside of the four walls of the church, which is supposed to be a safe place, a sanctuary, the place that we come to meet God. But for many, we've turned our churches into businesses and brands and we know, we understand, I understand I'm not against prosperity, I'm not against wealth, because that's truly a part of God's nature, but it's not the most important part of God's nature in this season and in this hour. I believe that God is bringing emphasis back to his character and his heart, because as the church, we can't be so consumed with his hand that we forget to demonstrate his character. The love of God, that's his character. These messages have caused me to want to read the word of God, not from the perspective of how I, how I want to know, um, the perspective of how to get the promises of God, how to obtain the promises of God. It, you know, I found myself in a place where I had to examine even why I was reading the word. I really wasn't reading the word to know God, but I was reading the word to get something from God. You, you know what I'm saying? I hope this is making sense. It may seem like I'm rambling, but I, I guess I'm probably going to be more transparent than I've probably been in a while. But for me personally, you know, you're reading the word, but it's really because I'm looking to find the answer for this. I'm looking to find the answer to that. I'm looking to solve my problem here. I'm looking to solve my problem there, but not necessarily reading the word of God to know him with the intent that I'm reading this word, God, because I want to know you. And somewhere about maybe a month and a half ago, because we've been in this for um, since January, so maybe somewhere in the February early March, I made a decision that I was going to reread the Bible. And as I was rereading it, this time I set my heart to, that as I read your word, oh God, my only intent is to know you. My desire in this season is to know you. I don't want to just know your hand. I don't want to just know what you can do for me, but I want to know your heart. I want to know you, God. I really want to know you, God. That is my heart's desire. That is my intent in this season. So I began to reread the word. I began in Genesis. And as I read it with the intention to know him, as I came to a familiar passage of scripture, and go with me to Genesis 1, 26 and 28, and over the last um, few weeks outside of Resurrection Sunday, we have been reading this scripture because um, we were talking about the promises of God and the things that he has prepared for them that love him. And so as I read this familiar passage of scripture, Genesis 1 and 26, 27 and 28, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all of the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply. Replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. But this time when I read this prescription, the scripture, Genesis 1 and 26, that first part is what stood out to me. And God said, and if you got this in your Bible, I want you to highlight this. Let, let us make man in our Highlight our image and after our 
likeness, the likeness and image of the threefold person of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I began to see that from a different perspective. He said our, he didn't just say my image, but he said our image. I want them to be created after the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why? Because each uh, each personhood of God has different characteristics and personalities and traits that we all should carry, that we all should exemplify, that we all should demonstrate. His image and his likeness both refer to his resemblance and to be like God. I come to a place where I don't just want to be like him in a place of wealth and prosperity and all of these different things, but I really want to be like him from the aspect of his character. In times before, I would, would bypass his likeness and image and go straight for what he had promised. His gifts towards me, oh God, you caused me to multiply, to replenish, to subdue, and to have dominion. And while those things are good, I believe in this season, if you don't walk in his image and likeness as it relates to his character, what we do with those things, his promises, his hand, we won't use them to glorify God. So you can have that. I've seen people in, in, in positions of power that walk in levels of authority, but because they didn't have a love, they took that authority and they manipulated. They t see, uh, the, um, Authority without love is nothing more than witchcraft because witchcraft is intimidation, manipulation, and domination. If you have authority but you don't have the love of God, somehow the enemy will come in and pervert that authority and your abilities to use them to dominate people, to manipulate people, and to intimidate people. Hallelujah. So we must have his character. And so as I was looking at this, and this is the title of my message and where it comes from, it comes from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verses 31. And I'm going to be reading this from the Amplified Version. We're still talking about being in his likeness and image. But the title of my message tonight is A More Excellent Way. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31. It says, but earnestly desire and zealous, zealously cultivate the greatest and best gifts and graces. He's, and this is the word he told us. We can earnestly desire, be zealous and cultivate the greatest and the best gifts and graces, the higher gifts and the choices of graces. He said, but you can do all of that. And yet I will show you still a more excellent way. One that is better by far and the highest of them all unselfish love he said greater than the greatest gifts the best gifts the greatest choices the choices graces that we could have we could earnestly desire all of these things and if you um I'm not going to go through all of this for the sake of time but first Corinthians chapter 12 it was talking about the gifts of the, of the spirit the nine gifts of the spirit and all of these different things and, and if you read this he, he got to this point because the Corinthian people they had uh become kind of in, in um, jealousy and competition and envy with one another over these, these gifts. And so he was, he was settling, Apostle Paul was settling the dispute that they had over this. And his way to dispute this and to settle their dispute was to tell them what he was saying is that you can have and operate in the greatest and the best gifts and the graces, but there's still something that is even better than that. We become a people that is promise and gift driven but higher than the promises and gifts we ought to pursue even harder for what's more excellent to be like him that is to live a life in unselfish love this word more excellent as I looked at it it meant a more superior life as in regard to how you've been living why? Because God is love, and when we understand how he loves, and then we demonstrate that kind of love, we are the most like him. If we really want to be like God in that place of being like him, yes, he, he tells us we should prophesy. We should heal the sick. We should lay hands on them. They shall recover. We should cast out devils and demons. We should do all these things. We should multiply, reproduce. We should be blessed. We should experience all of those things. But more than that, he says, I have a more excellent way for you. A more excellent way to live is pursuing to reach the place of love that God has called us to rather than pursuing the promises of God. The scripture in 1 Corinthians 12 and 31 
As I said, it came about because the people were so concerned with the gifts that it had created a sense of jealousy and comparison amongst each other concerning the gifts of God, as well as they felt that those with the greater gifts took precedence over those that had that may had what would be considered lesser graces. And sometimes we can feel like that. And what I began to look at is over the last decade, you know, it comes in waves in the body of Christ, what we consider to be the greatest gift of the hour. I call it the greatest gift of the hour, what we want to walk in. We went through a phase where the teacher was, was everybody wanted to be a teacher. We went through phases where everybody and their mama was called to be a pastor. Then the, this last one we went through where everybody and their mama wanted to be a prophet but now we're in this dispensation where everybody and their mama want to be an apostle everybody want to be an apostle i've seen people who um in, maybe two years ago they were calling themselves prophet and then next thing you know now you're an apostle and i get it times and seasons who are, i'm not judging that do what you want but i'm making the point that it, it it comes about people go after what they consider is the greatest gift at the time in the moment why because people can continue to think in the body of christ if i'm not operating in the, as an apostle if i'm not operating under the five-fold ministry gift they can tend to feel like then i am not significant and that maybe God don't love me the way that he loves somebody else because if he did then why don't I have these same graces why wasn't I called to be an apostle why wasn't I called to be a prophet why wasn't I called to be all of these different things we try to measure God's love for us based on gifts and promises if I don't have the gifts or the promises then that that must mean God loves me less, which equates to a feeling of in, being insignificant. But here's the answer. First Corinthians 12 and 29. Paul began to say this to them. He said, I'm reading for the Amplified again. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? He said, do all, no, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, interpret? and his answer was, and of course not, meaning some will be doorkeepers, some will be greeters, some will be ushers, some will be hospitality, and if you want to really bring it on down, some will simply be uh, uh, wives and mothers and, and fathers and husbands, you may not be be called to the fivefold ministry, but whatever God has placed you or whatever he's called you to do, you are significant. And so as we're going through this, I'm just going to begin to give some points concerning love and how it is a more excellent way. And the number one point we need to always remember is love, a revelation of God's love. God's kind of love values and embraces what is given. So that means it doesn't matter what you give me. It doesn't matter what title you put upon me or no title at all. My, my value is not measured in a title, but my value is measured by the love of God. Amen. And when we come to an understanding that who I am is measured by the love of God because he loves me and he loves me unconditionally, there's no room for jealousy. There's no room for envy. There's no room for competition or comparison. So in this hour, we must come to an understanding that what God has given us isn't insignificant. It's just different, right? Because if you read that, that, that chapter, first and 12, he said it's the same spirit that gives all the gifts. He said, but there's a different administration, which means that it doesn't matter what your administration is or what you operate in. It, it, it doesn't mean you're less. It just means I've given you something different. And then he goes on to explain because we are the body of Christ. And it, it, I think he talks about, you know, you know we can't say we, our physical body can't say that the feet ain't important, but if I don't have feet, I can't walk, right? If my feet is just as important as other par portions of my body. And I thought about this, even like uh, some may look at those that are CEOs of company and different things, but here's the case. We all can be a CEO over something. If you are a wife, if you are a mother, if you are a husband, if you are a father, you are a CEO. You're a CEO, it just look different because you're managing something different. You, you're managing a family versus managing a corporation. 
Amen. This is why he then went right into what matters to God the most. It is the excellence of love. First Corinthians chapter 13. We're going into first Corinthians chapter 13 concerning love because a person that has the ability to manifest all the promises and utilize the gifts without God's character or nature will use it selfishly. Being able to manifest God's hand isn't evident evidence of a spirit-filled life, but manifesting his heart and the excellency of his love, it is evidence of a spirit-filled life. G could it be one of the things that apostle began to talk about was why why it isn't working for us why certain things aren't working for us why come we feel like the word of god it ain't working for me i'm not experiencing this i'm not getting the results that other people are getting maybe some of the things that god has promised us they aren't working or we haven't received them yet to, in our lives because he knows that if he released it to us we would use it for ourselves or could it be that he's testing you to see if he doesn't give you his hand will you still want it heart can you still love him when he don't heal your body or I won't even say he don't he doesn't heal your your body but you don't receive the healing that is promised in the word of God if you don't receive the prosperity that's promised in the word of God if you don't see your whole family saved like it's been prophesied like the word of God says household salvation those are a part of the benefit package of God but will you still want his heart hallelujah will you still say lord if you never did if you never bless me again it was like the three hebrew they said and if he don't do it he's still god you know we gotta come to a place where we get so in love with him come on where we get so in love with him it don't matter if you don't bless me god if i never see this that or the other other things that i think that i'm supposed to have i love you god i'm so in love with you hallelujah glory be to god what do i mean one of the things I noticed is that many have figured out how to increase and, and multiply, how to operate in their gifts. But what we now do is people begin to charge people to teach them how to manifest the promises and walk in their gifts and talents. We justify this by saying things like the oil on my life cost. But if we're in his likeness and his image, where do we see in the Bible, in the New Testament, that Jesus charged anyone to teach them how to operate in kingdom principles? The Bible tells us that the only cost for discipleship is, you can read Luke 14, 26 through 27 for yourself. Also, Matthew 10, the heading of it says the cost of discipleship but to sum it all up it goes back to this deny yourself take up your cross and follow after me and simply love me more than anything else it goes back to Matthew 6 and 33 seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness and then and only then will all these other things be added unto you we got to get back to a place where it's him and only him oh my god we put him first. We've taken the concept, the, and I'm talking about the body of Christ, has taken the concept of discipleship and turned it into a business. When walking in a more excellent way, it will cause me mean not to try to charge people and what do I mean by this if you go up and down your Facebook timeline you see so many people charging to disciple people because that's all it is as the body of Christ now we don't and some of us some of the people in the body of Christ you don't want to be passing no more you have taken the title I'm a life coach I'm a mentor I'm all of these different things why because if you use those titles then you can add a fee to what you're doing but simply you're only doing what we supposed to do he said make disciples out of them but when I'm walking in the love of God when I have his true likeness and his image I, I don't care how much it costs me to get the oil or, or whatever with these things that we're saying this jargon that I'm hearing uh, uh, uh that's been out there I want to disciple somebody else that's one of the greatest things we ought to, to reproduce that's why he said the threefold in our image because Jesus was the perfect example of reproducing himself in the 12 disciples he didn't charge them to to, to pour into them for them to go with him, for him to mentor them, for him to teach them how to, to, to manifest the kingdom of God and how to do everything that he was doing, how to live a hallelujah and out the kingdom principles of God. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't ask them for a time. 
He simply said, leave everything and come and follow me. In fact, he didn't charge because he loved us so much. He was willing to pay the price for what we for what we needed. Yes, if if it, it is going to cost you something, it's, it cost him a great deal. But freely we receive, freely we give. The love of God, write this down. This is the next point. The love of God is the kind of love that gives another person the advantage. Come on. The love of God is the kind of love that gives another person the advantage. Everything that Jesus did, it wasn't for him. It was an unselfish love. He died on that cross. That's why the song was ministering to me. It was his cross, but it was my freedom. Come on, the love of God gave me the advantage. It was his stripes, but it became my healing. The love of God gave me the advantage. He didn't get nothing out the deal except for when it was all said and done. He ascended onto glory and he got to sit at the right hand of the father which we which ultimately that that is the great it was eternity his reward was eternity spending eternity with the father hallelujah when we're talking about a more excellent way to god why we do what we do motives is more important than what we do we're talking about because it should give another person the advantage so we got to begin to examine our motives why are we doing what we doing and I had to come to the place where for so long and I've been a person that I've struggled with this love thing for years why because I, I experienced so much trauma as a child that it was challenging for me to love in the magnitude and the way that God wanted me to love. And for so long, this was my position. God, I'm going to do it because it's the right thing to do. And I think that for a time period, that was that was acceptable to God. That was honorable because in my heart, I didn't know how to love. But I was trying my best. I said, God. It's the right thing to do. It's your way, and I want to please you. So even though somewhere in my heart is challenged to love those that hurt me, but it's the right thing to do. But I've come to a place, these messages, I don't want to do it no more because it's the right thing to do. I want to do it because your love is in me, God. I want to do it because I'm made in your likeness and in your image. And if you were able to love your, your offenders, to love your abusers, to love those that crucified you, how much more should I be able to love them? And I'm going to tell you, it's been challenging. Over the last few weeks, And I didn't know if I wanted to share this, but I'm going to share. It had been coming up in my spirit. As a child, I was molested. And about a couple of weeks ago, I was praying. And I didn't know why God kept bringing that to before me. And so as I was praying, the Lord said, this is a demonstration of love. I need you to pray for that person that molested you. Now, here's the thing. Up until this point, I would be cordial. I would be nice. I would do my best. But I've never prayed for the person. I would only pray for those that he may have done that else to, right? If you understand what I'm saying. My heart wasn't for him, but my heart was for the people other children because I understood if he did it to me I know well enough to know he did it to somebody else so all this time yes in faith in Christ walking all of these things my heart was God I can't pray for him but I'll pray for them but God began to challenge me to pray for him and all of a sudden, the love of God came upon me, and I began to pray for his deliverance. I began to pray for his, his salvation. I began to pray for his life. Now, I'm not one that people, you know how people minister or do whatever they do, and they say, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost, or I feel the anointing. I'm not that type of person. If I'm preaching, ministering, teaching, praying, I don't usually feel the anointing. But as I begin to pray for him, as a demonstration of the love of God, I begin to feel the anointing of God. God come upon me. So fast forward. Now this person I haven't seen in years. I didn't even know this person lived here in Muskegon. And out the blue, three days ago, who did I run into? The person that molested me. 
And we were with a group of people. My husband was there. And here's the other part about it. This person has never admitted what they've done. But you know, when you come face to face with somebody that did something wrong to you, whether they say they did it or not, you can see that they know that you know what they did was wrong. And so later on that day, my husband said, well, there was a lot of tension between you and such and such. And because he was talking to me as if nothing was wrong. And in that moment, it kind of caught me off guard because I wasn't expecting to see this person. And I didn't know what to do, to be honest. I didn't know whether I wanted to be angry. I didn't know whether I wanted to be filled with rage. But I do know that in that moment, I didn't feel none of those things. I didn't feel rage. I didn't feel anger. I didn't necessarily want to hee hee key key, you know, like everything good kind of thing. I didn't want to do all of that. But I didn't feel rage. I didn't feel anger no more. I didn't feel like I wanted to jump across the table and choke them, right? But apparently my husband, because he knows me, he could sense the tension. So I didn't say nothing. He asked me, and I know right now he's probably thinking she never answered me because I didn't know what I was feeling. I didn't know how to feel about it. But all I knew was God kept bringing this thing before me. And so the next day, make a long story short, when I got up, what was in my spirit, it was no matter what, I'll still praise you, God. I'll still serve you, God. I'll still love you, God. Why? Because that's what the love of God is. And I'll continue to pray for his salvation. I'll continue to want him to be free. And the Lord began to speak to me. He said, you know what? Because he's worthy of salvation just like you are. There was a time where I didn't feel like he was worthy of salvation. But these messages on love has brought me to a place where I can say, you know what? He is worthy of salvation. He is worthy of deliverance. It don't matter what he done to me, but God still loves him just like he loves me. And I couldn't reconcile with that in the past before. But today I stand before you. And I know even though I'm weeping and I'm crying, it's because I had to look and I said, you know what, today was the first day that I really acknowledged that. And I said, you know what, God, no matter what the devil has done, I'm still standing because of your love. Your love kept me through all of that. This is a revelation of God's love. So when you look back at your past and you look back at the trauma, you look back at everything that you've been through, you will have to know and receive it was nothing but the love of Jesus that has kept you I'm still standing and I'm not broken I'm not defeated hallelujah I'm standing here preaching the word of God That's the love of God. Hallelujah. That's a more excellent way. That is a more excellent way. And then the Lord began, he said, you know what? And I don't know if this is right or wrong, but in my spirit I felt, what if I allowed that to happen to you? Because out of all the people he probably did it to, you were the only one that could raise up to a place to earnestly pray for him. What if God allowed you to go through what you went through? Because he could trust you enough. He trusts your heart with that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Love isn't just an outward action. Doing all that the Bible says without love is a spirit of religion. It becomes about the works, not the love and devotion to God. That was me in the beginning. I'm doing it because it's right, God. It's a spirit of religion. I'm only doing it because it's the right thing to do. Your word tells me to do it. But I'm not doing it because there's an inner devotion and love so run so deep on the inside of me, God. Whew. Come on, we break that spirit of religion. We're not just in here doing the works of God. We're not in here because we're obligated. 
because it's a requirement, because it's the right thing to do. We're doing it because I have a revelation of God's love. Hey! It's not a love that is fueled from an inner love. It's not a love. It's a love. It is a love that's fueled from an inner love and devotion to God. The God kind of love is a love that is empowered by and can only be executed by being in relationship with God. Being in relationship with him gives us the ability to know his heart. His heart is always for his people. That's why I could come to the conclusion and say he's worthy of salvation as well. He's worthy of deliverance as well. Why? Because that's the God kind of love. God's heart is always for his people and how we can help each other. Because we're not just to be like him, Father, but also his spirit, Holy Spirit. The God kind of love is a fruit of the spirit. It's not a nat- it's not natural as in feeling, but supernatural in the source of this kind of love is empowered and only executed by Holy Spirit. See, in and of myself, that's why it's called the fruit of the spirit. In and of myself, is there's probably nothing in my flesh that want to pray for him. There was nothing in my flesh that said he deserves salvation. But the supernatural love of God, the power, the God kind of love. Oh, my God, when we are infused with the power of the Holy Ghost, he gives us the ability. It is the Holy Spirit that empowers us to love like God loves and to walk this thing out I can't do it in my own strength I can't love those who hurt me in my own strength but it's you Holy Ghost living in me moving breathing living working hallelujah gives me the ability to show forth your characteristics and I'm gonna go through these quickly as we come into a close hallelujah Glory be your name, Jesus. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7, can only come from the fruit of the Spirit. And it talks about love. Come on. Love endures with patience and serenity. Love is kind and thoughtful and is not jealous or envious. Love does not brag and is not proud or arrogant. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not provoked nor overly sensitive and easily angered. It does not take into account a wrong endured. God, you bring us to a place your love, empowered and executed by the power of the Holy Spirit, causes us to not keep an account of the wrong doing it does not rejoice at injustice but rejoices with the truth when right and truth prevail love bears all things because of the love of God we can bear all things regardless of what comes it believes all things it's looking for the best in each one it hopes all things remaining steadfast during difficult times and doing all things without weakening come on the love of God, it never fails. It never fails nor ends. Hallelujah. And in these last few minutes, I, and I, I, I admonish you to go back and look through 1 Corinthians 13, chapter 4, I mean, verses 4 through 8. And each one of them has such a significance and such a meaning in within themselves. Look at the commentary that really breaks it down. Look at the definitions of those. And I'm just going to throw a fruit out here that I, that I wanted to pull out that I felt like the Lord was highlighting to me. Listen, love is patient and long suffering it doesn't mean that I won't experience any type of anger or frustration come on sometimes we, we we've been made to feel like you ain't supposed to get angry you won't experience any frustration but it does mean this that when I love in a more excellent way that God loves I won't act on those emotions so it's not that I don't feel them but I won't act on them type of emotions why because I have the love of God on the inside of me so in that moment where we was and I seen this person I didn't know what to do but because of the love of God I just didn't hardly say anything because I wasn't going to act out in frustration or emotions this means when love is patient and long suffering it means that I can endure evil I can endure injury I can endure provocation without being filled with resentment indignation or revenge come on 
Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Come on, we're in his likeness and in his image. Jesus gave us the blueprints as, as how to handle these things. He showed us how to endure evil. He showed us how to endure injury. He showed us how to endure provocation. Come on, he wasn't resentful. He wasn't in, in indignation. He didn't want revenge, but he said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Come on, we're in his likeness and in his image. Woo. We ought to, pers ought to put to pursue to respond the way he did against those that hurt us. Love is kind and thoughtful. It is having the ability to be courteous and obliging. It's a place where our hearts are large and our hands are open. Come on, we, we are supposed to be a people that look for opportunities to be kind to one another. Come on, it takes nothing to be thoughtful. Come on, be thoughtful of somebody else's time. Come on, that's love. I'm not going to waste your time. That's love. I'm going to be thoughtful. You run across my mind, I'm going to pick up the phone and call you. I'm going to text you. It's something about just shooting somebody a text to say, you know what? I value you. That's the love of God. Come on, we become such a people. When somebody do something for us, we don't even know how to say, you know what? You are valuable to me. Love isn't jealous or envious. We're not grieved at the good of others. We're not grieved at their gifts. We're not grieved at other people's good qualities. We're not grieved at their honors. We're not grieved at their estates. But in fact, love will cause us to rejoice. And we have the understanding that what they have is of a benefit to us if they truly are walking in the love of God. So I don't have to be jealous of your gifts, your graces, or nothing else that you have. Because if you walk in the love of God, you're going to want to bless me. Hallelujah. You're going to want to use that gift to help me, to edify me, to comfort me, to build me up, to strengthen me when I'm weak. Love isn't prideful. True love will always oppose selfish ambition. There's a scripture in um, Thessalonians that says... Uh, no, sorry, that's the wrong scripture. True love will always oppose selfish ambition, vainglory, arrogance, and contention. But true love will always honor, prefer, and esteem one another higher than itself. Love, it will hide faults that appear. Come on. Love will hide faults that appear. There was a time where I wanted everybody to know what that person had done to me. But now it's like I can't expose this person. The love of God covers a multitude of sins. It's not quick to expose the wrongs of others. We don't have to go around making sure that everyone knows what a person did to us. It doesn't mean that we won't have to address it with that person. Now, you may have to address the wrong with the person, but we won't be eager to let everyone else know what that person did but instead we will pass we but instead we'll pass by and put up with injuries without indulging in anger or cherishing revenge love isn't suspicious without proof come on we got so many people in the body of Christ that is suspicious. We don't trust nobody. Come on, we've been so uh, uh, hurt and abused and traumatized in the world. We come into the church, we suspicious of everybody. What they want with me, what they want with my gift. Why they coming over here talking to me? Why they prophesying to me? We, you know, come on, love is not suspicious without proof. Oftentimes in the church, we can't, we can't believe that people are only doing things for us. We can, we can believe that people are only doing things for us to get something from us, not because they genuinely love us. Come on, this, we ain't in the world. Even if there is proof, now this is how you combat that, because sometimes it may be proof. But even if there is proof that they only want something from you, love will be reluctant to let one will be reluctant to let the one thing that they did do cause you to form an ill opinion of the person. Why? Because love is always hopeful. 
love is hopeful. So I'm going to keep believing that one day God going to touch your heart. Come on, one day God going to penetrate your heart. One day the love of God is going to get a hold to you, and you're going to do better. You're going to act right. You're going to live right. You're going to walk with character and integrity. Love is always hopeful. I'm going to end with this. The end of the matter is this. If we never receive the promises or have the gifts, the God kind of fervent love will give us the mind of fortitude and firmness because it never fails. If in this life, come on, this life that we live in, in this earth, it won't always be sweet. There will be times of trauma hardships come on I can promise you that there will be trauma there will be hardships we've lived in times that we've never seen most of us in our times there's been some trauma there's been some hardships come on there may even be some unanswered prayers you may not receive your healing on this side of glory but what I can tell you is when you have a revelation of God's love it will give you the mental and emotional stability to stay patient to continue to be kind it will help you not be entitled in this world. Hallelujah. That's the God kind of love. And when you operate in the excellency of love, you will live a more excellent way. Hallelujah. You'll live a more excellent way. And so, people of God, we must begin to pursue after this more excellent way of living as in regard to how we've been living before 2022 and we start hearing these messages of love we gotta start living in a more excellent way in a more superior way that when i come up against things now i don't respond the same way i used to respond i don't act the same way i used to act i don't behave the same way i used to behave but i try to figure out god what would you do because i'm made in your likeness and in your image Hallelujah. So, Father, we thank you for this word on tonight. We thank you for that which you're doing in our hearts, our minds, our soul, our will, our emotions, our hearts, our lives, Lord God. These will not just be messages, but our intention. You say, he that have an ear, let him hear what the word, what the Lord is saying. We can't just be hearers. We won't just be hearers, but we will be doers of your word these things we do pray in jesus mighty name we give you glory honor and praise on tonight father and we thank you i thank you all for tuning in good night